overall a school of engineering at Warwick. The, the, the uh, benefit of that for me is that they, most of them are following a four-year MEng program and they all are going to do a third year individual project as most students do um, but then when they go into the fourth year a, a big part of their fourth year 25 percent is, is to be in a very significant group project so because you can do group projects wherever you are but if you're in a mechanical department you'll do group projects with mechanical students won't you and as we all know engineering is done multidisciplinary engineers have to talk to each other people from different disciplines so all these guys here are a mix of mechanical manufacturing manufacturing, electrical, electronic, um, systems engineering, of course, particularly for us is an important thing, uh, and computing and so on. One of our weaknesses is comms. <laughs> so we're very pleased to have the link with you because often we do need help with comms because even the electrical, electronic guys may or may not have interest in comms. It's, some, you know, it's a bit variable. Sometimes I get somebody who's quite good on it and sometimes I've, I've got years where I'm quite lean. So you know, we're, we're very pleased to have any additional help with comms. Uh, anyway, that's a kind of mix, and one or two of these are actually PhD students who were in previous WUSAT teams and are still around and that they'll still help out. And th this is Julia here, who I would say is, is, is now batting between Germany, France and Italy, desperately trying to get the first launch off for MTG3 in now, I think, early December. So what have, we, what have we done? So we started in 2006, uh, and uh, I won't tell the story about how it started, a bit of madness on my part, but it seemed one of these fate things, and we got into something quite big, really, for a, a, a kind of start-up team, that uh, we got involved with this ESMO project, which is an ESA satellite, and uh, we were, as you see, the primary team to design the electrical power supply system, and, of course, still very much a need for multidisciplinary, because, we, we know, this includes the... Um, the uh, solar arrays which were custom built and of course the design for this changes all the time as they're looking at different payloads and the things developing as you usually get on projects like this um, so plenty of need for mechanical students it's still a very big systems project maximum powerpoint tracking to optimize the output of the solar arrays Battery and charging systems were still, you know, qu quite a big thing. I remember the battery we, we were uh, developing with ABSL on the Harwell Science Park. Even the battery was something like eighty, ninety thousand pounds with a kit, <laughs> um, and of course it was it was done, you know, custom made, including, you know, how it was going to be the, the actual casing and how it, was, how it was fitted and thermal management and the whole thing like that. So, you know, we needed that mix of students. But the key thing about this was especially spending six years on it, was that Surrey Satellite Technology was a prime contractor, but it really meant that we had a lot of experience then at, at how you walk a satellite through the ESA system. You know, it's quite rigorous, and they don't just say, oh, it's just a student project, because it's still going on a launch, it's still expensive, it might be going to the International Space Station if, it, if it's a CubeSat or something like that. So we would be there with, with the, some of the guys from SSTL, a panel the other side, submitted all the documentation, and it was quite a rigorous process. They did us a lot of good spending six years doing that and knowing what's involved. So when that came to an end in 2012, uh, oh, sorry, there's a little video here. Is this going to run? It might do. It might not. Oh, it is. Sorry about the clunky start. It's not my video. It's, it's uh, ESA's. I don't know whether you can hear that. During the night of the 27th, 28th September 2003. Just about. It's only fairly short. Uh, it, it, it was the same uh, process as uh, Smart One, which, which they had launched before, um, and it carried instrumentation you know, analyzing the, the moon the surface launcher, and as one things of three like payloads, that. The European Space Agency's Smart One spacecraft was placed into an elliptical geostationary transfer orbit. From yeah, this starting position, it will spend about 16 months in a slow spiralling trajectory towards our closest neighbour. Yeah, so and effectively it's, it, it's launched out from an Earth orbit to pick up a moon orbit eventually. Smart One, an abbreviation for Small Missions for Advanced Research and Technology, is the first of a series of ESA projects designed to test key technologies for the spacecraft of the future. Together with this, Smart One carries a number of instruments that will carry out studies of the lunar surface. In the case of this first pioneering mission, the technologies are twofold. The primary objective is to test the use. That, that's my fault, cutting that off. <laughs> 
the primary objective is uh, to, to carry those instruments that, 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 that they were using to uh, analyse the, the, the moon's surface. But I say the key thing for us was it was a pretty big thing for us to be involved with, 21 European partners working with Surrey Satellite Technology, and you know, that, that really gave us a hell of a boost, you know, spending six years doing something like that. And uh, you can imagine the, the CVs that the students were finishing with. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and we brought a lot in. You know, ESA really liked WUSAT because we brought things like that expensive battery and things. You know, we, we brought a lot in with all the companies we were working with. So the only thing was, of course, that when that finished, of course, we were suddenly on our own for a while. So, sorry, that's a bit out of focus, but obviously CubeSats is the obvious thing for a, 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 a university team to do. And so we had a bit of fun with it, with just prototyping at first. Well, it didn't do anything all that sort of special. It, j it just measured a bit of temperature and altitude and things like that. And we launched it by, as it says there, high altitude helium balloons. So we got CAA approval. We had to take it to a, a site at uh, Welshpool, not far from the little local airfield, and launch it there. And it was just good fun. You know, the students liked it. It was a nice day out. I was very impressed by one thing, is that um, there was a little film that students made here. You see them launching it. And we had it all set out on mats and things. I think there's one or two pictures there. Um, and so one car set off straight away to try and track the thing back and follow it. And they lost contact with it, I think, about sort of halfway back. And we were, we were busily packing up and then going after them. Uh, but they had used some software to predict the, the flight path from, and obviously having regular updates from the Met Office and so on. And we thought, oh dear, you know, we've sort of lost track, lost track with it sort of halfway back. So, well, let's just go to the predicted spot that was in Ettington in, in Warwickshire, not all that far from the university. And lo, lo and behold, there it was about 100 metres away, <laughs> hanging in a hedge. So I was quite impressed with that, that they, they predicted that quite well, considering, you know, what it went to. And of course, the advantage of something like a, a you know, helium balloon launch, of course, is that universities like lots of video clips and, and images. And of course, you can bolt things like this on. Uh, you know, GoPro cameras and things like that, to, which of course you can't normally do in a launch. And it's not always all that technical. I mean, they, we, we, we built this polystyrene sort of casing for it to go in. And then, you know, you know those um, pouches you get, like those hand warmers that you scrunch up in gloves? We, we just made some cavities and did that and pushed them all in, sealed it all up. And when we opened it, after we found it, it was... Um, it was, uh, you know, warm as toast. <laughs> so, you know, so it's good, good fun. And, you know, that, that, there we all are on, on the field at, uh, at Welsh Pool. I had to do the official helium bit, obviously, because the, sa the safety aspect of it. And there it is on its way up with the, uh, the, the parachute here, obviously, when the, when the balloon eventually bursts. So that kind of got us into, you know, having a little look at CubeSats. And then from that, we, we, we were able to get... Oh, that's a, an image it took. I think that's roughly the Wirral. <laughs> From, from Welshpool, but it's the kind of thing you don't get off, obviously on normal launches. Um, so from that, we, we then got straight back into quite a decent um, project, again with ESA, uh, collaborating also with the German Aerospace Centre DLR and the Swedish National Space Board. Um, and this was a two-year project, as you see, 2013 to 15. And the concept of it was uh, given by a prof Professor Don Polarco, who's a physics uh, professor at Warwick. And he's quite a big space guy. You know, he heads up the, space cons the science consortium that that's operating the uh, PLATO project that ESA are now building with Talos Alenia Space. This is a kind of a 17 telescope thing that's supposed to look for exoplanets. It was you know, a pretty big project. Anyway, the, the concept was that uh, it'd be like a single unit CubeSat. You see these uh, domes either side here. They had little light sensors with fiber optics going into a light spectrometer. And um, this, of course, is a, a sounding rocket rather than an orbital launch. So it went up to about 90 kilometers. Uh, the nose cone was ejected. And, and then at some point later, we had two pyro cutters. If, if, I think there might be a picture you can see, or you'll, you'll see it coming together here. And it ejected the satellite out. So we couldn't use a standard CubeSat deployment method because of those two domes either side, because it's non-standard to, to do that with a CubeSat, as you see with these here. Um, so it went on Rexus 17. It was launched um, from the Swedish Space Centre north of the Arctic Circle in Kiruna. And... Um, 
uh, you know, it's quite a harsh situation for anything to work in because it's literally as it's coming back down, so it's kind of twice the speed of sound. We heard the sonic booms from the ground, and you're asking it to sort of start reading light frequencies through a light spectrometer and to estimate the density of gases in the upper atmosphere. That's what the guy was interested in. Uh, and then, of course, you're not going to get it back. It's going to bury itself if it doesn't, you know, burn up, bury itself. Um, several metres below the Arctic tundra when it comes down. So we were heavily reliant on the, um, the, the comms working to get some data back from it. Um, <coughs> and the, the pleasing thing was, the little video here you can see of that event. So the team were all out there for two weeks in Sweden. I went out for about four days over the launch period. So again, you can Oh, good. These are just laptops in the back of the car. That was our ground station. It's still signal, it's just... Yes! <laughs> what, what an emotional response. And Issa said, of that sort of launch, this, this is an important guy here, this is Piero Gallioni, he's got a system, senior systems guy at Issa, for the fact that he's... That he's taking pictures and taking this on board, you know, was quite a thing for us. And as I say, they told us later that it was the first one in 17 launches of that sort where the ejected module actually actually worked and got the comms down to the ground. So, um, yeah, that, that stood instead, obviously, in building our kind of reputation with ESA and so on. Yeah, that's just what I said there. So from that, we then got into something which we're still sort of into. This is, this is rumbling on a little bit, uh, uh, WUSAT 3, our sort of fourth mission. Um, but we're now getting into the area that's critical to this UK SciSats programme because the uh, payload for this w had been developed by Rope Manor Research. I don't know if that's a name any of you have come across. They're, they're based in Hampshire. They tend to do a lot of defence work, so <laughs> it was quite odd whenever we went down there. They're very positive, and then when you came away, you weren't quite sure what they told you, because they kept everything very very close to their chest, but they're very positive without actually telling you an awful lot. So essentially what they'd done is they'd come up with um, uh, a technology for detecting, and this is much more in your area than mine, detecting the location of RFID type signals on the ground without using GPS or the device you know, itself you know, didn't, didn't use GPS. And so I know they'd got other defense related interests in this. So they, they'd had you know, ground based systems that they'd had working, but they wanted to trial it in, in low Earth orbit. So that, that was our kind of role. And they didn't give us a lot. <laughs> they'd got all the software for doing this. You know, they, they kind of just kept pushing little bits towards us. Uh, I'll show you roughly what's involved here. So uh, we had a three unit CubeSat. Um, we, we, we have a very good link with a company called XCAM in, in Northampton. And, uh, through various means, they ended up donating um, uh, a camera system that had already got flight heritage in a CubeSat. So obviously that saves us all the testing costs and so on. And, and then these four antenna, if you were looking straight on at that, and again, this would mean much more to you than me, they're actually positioned on a helical, uh, a hexagon basis. So, so it's like uh, four points, you know, imagine the center one, these two out here, not these two, but the one in here, I think based on a quarter of the wavelength or something, is 915 megahertz, something like 30 centimeters wavelength. I don't know, I think something like that. There's some relationship between the setup of those antenna and the wavelength, but uh, that's all we need to know really. And it, essentially, um, what, yeah, so it's, good, it, it was, it, it's, it's designed, this, this one's designed for a nanorax deployment from, from the ISS, but of course that's a bit dependent on, on ESA uh, when it gets to that stage. Um, and essentially, the, the, as I understand it, and again, <laughs> much more in your area than mine, the principle of it is, is that if you're passing over Europe, and what we intend to do is set up uh, pseudo tags at known, known locations. So it, it would detect the signal, obviously work out from the ID that it is one of our tags or one of our pseudo tags, our test tags. And at that point, the camera takes an image of the surface below and you can tell me the four antenna patches, they kind of take a snapshot of what's on each patch at the same time. And 
from that data, they could feed that into their software and they can work out effectively a kind of an offset. If that makes this is the explanation I use because I have to give this talk to often non technical audiences. So, if you reasonably okay with that, 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 that's my understanding of roughly how it works that it generates an offset and they can then, when, when, when it's uh, so, all we're doing is passing the data captured on the antenna for antenna patches and the image down to the ground. They feed it into their software, it works out the location roughly of uh, where the signal source is within the image, and then of course they overlap that on a kind of a map image to give it an actual proper geolocation and it's got a date time stamp against it so for us what we were directing it at, at very much because we work with companies called the uh, low tech and and biotrack you often see those if you watch um, wildlife programs on the tv very often you see a biotrack label on on their tracking thing um, so we were working with them and of course they were really interested in this because if you're using wildlife monitoring from space, effectively it's the job of the tag to collect GPS data as the animal or birds moving around, and then almost more ludicrously, transmit it up to an overhead satellite as it, as it passes over, which is why, of course, they're so big and heavy. So the real goal for them is, you know, for the sort of ranges of species that they would like to be able to monitor, you know, biodiversity uh, research and things like that, is, you know, can we make them much lighter and smaller? So this, this offered this possibility of, of being able to do that, if you can get rid of that GPS link. Um, and obviously that, that's my crude explanation of roughly how it would, wouldn't in practice be quite like that, but that's, when, I, when I'm trying to explain it to other people, that, that, that's the kind of basis it works on. The, the problem, the real problem with this, of course, is that, uh, and it's, it's uh, inherent, of course, that most people don't realise that when you're designing satellites, even if they all look the same size, and even if they all look outwardly fairly much the same, um, the, the level of complexity and cost and amount of testing and time to get to launch and so on varies enormously depending what the payload requirement is. And of course, if you're going to do that, uh, you, you need an ADCS system, attitude determination control system, to obviously stabilise the, the spacecraft, point it, and, and, and Rope wanted it pretty stable in a pointed condition as well when it was doing this. So um, that, that's kind of why it's dragged on a little bit, and we, we've got involved with Cube Space in South Africa, and they've run some simulations for us, and uh, we haven't given up on it yet, but you know we, we've hit a few expensive and slightly difficult things with it but it's been you know it's been a really good um, you know, process of, of what we've gone through it the main thing is whatever we do the students get a huge amount out of it anyway um, and of course it, you might see pictures of birds and things with tags that size, but the, uh, there's no way they're going to be involved with this, with a space-based. <laughs> some, some companies like to publish things like that as if they are, but they're not. <laughs> they're only involved with people walking around with aerials, of course. So. Mission five, uh, uh, sorry about the, the, the crude conceptual drawing here, we're literally just starting this, but I think this is quite key to what I'm going to move on to in a minute about the, you know, the overall process of WUSAT and what's involved in really small satellite future, uh, you know, development for the future in this country, I think, in many ways. So uh, we've now got involved with UK launch services. Uh, we've had you know, things to do with them before, you know, CANSAT projects and things like that over the last sort of uh, two or three years. And they've got funding for developing this beacon, this, this beep thing as they call it. Um, and the idea of the beacon is that um, they haven't told us anything about the technology. I mean, these boxes are just placeholders. They don't represent anything particular. So they've got some technology that they've been looking at for this beacon device. The idea they've got is that eventually it could be perhaps about a centimetre thick, you know, to, to go onto the side of a CubeSat or anything else that might get left in orbit, with the idea that it, it could run for 20, 25 years after the operational period of whatever it's on. Um, and it, it can transmit out uh, location of the device and also its orientation. Is it, is it very stable or not? For two potential reasons, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a bit, it's on the other slide here, but while we're on it, I might as well do it. Um, a, if there's any space debris mitigation technology coming along that might want to know that, where is it and is it stable, is it rolling around a lot? Um, and, and also, of course, things like um, collision avoidance uh, manoeuvring and things like that, it could be very useful for. So anyway, they've got funding for it. Uh, we won't be developing anything like what they're hoping their final commercial um, model will be, but uh, 
what we will look at is hopefully a very efficient, maybe a supercapacitor type power supply so that it will last all this time. And, and of course, it's got to be a very standalone unit. It can't, it can't connect into any of the other satellite units. Uh, they're also interested in, you probably can't read that too well from there, um, some technology where you can imagine that if, if, you, if you've got something that, that, that thin, you know, like a patch that you're going to put on something, then the solar panel, of course, has got to be the, out, the outward facing side. And you'd also like that to be the antenna that's going to do the you know, transmitting the beacon information. So, of course, there is technology, maybe you've come across it, you know, it's, it's fairly new to me. It, there is technology that's being looked at, you know, where you can have this integrated antenna solar panel type idea. The, 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 the issue for us is that, um, is it still in like a, re, you know, a research stage or is it something we can actually buy and use? I suspect it's the, it's the, 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 the former. It's, it's still a bit, a bit of a research thing, which is okay. I mean, we can still test their, their technology if they want to. We can still develop a power supply and whatever else it needs. Um, and we will just have to use a separate solar panel and a separate transmitter, you know, because we're, we're not, you know, constrained to that, that kind of final device that they're looking for. So that's an industrial um, payload in development, you know, that would have a kind of an in-orbit in demonstration. And then as you see, the other one is a research one, um, a guy called Tim Etheridge at the University of Exeter. And again, I, I, I can't tell you much about this. It's a biological research. It's some kind of microscopic worm thing. And uh, it's being um, built into this kind of experimental unit. And ESA and NASA are both interested in it. They've got funding for it. And they're interested in it for some kind of interplanetary movement of biological things and can you monitor it or something. It doesn't really matter to us, obviously, because we're doing the engineering. So um, all we need to know is, you know, what, what are the requirements of this experiment, you know, in terms of power? Does it need things turning on and off? What sort of data? I think there are, there are, there are little inbuilt cameras in there. So that'll obviously affect... Uh, what data comes out of it, how it gets transmitted to the ground. What I don't want to get into is another, another difficult ADCS system. Uh, you know, the, the thing with the beacon is it can just be rolling around. <laughs> so the, the guy who, who's involved with the engineering of this uh, experimental device assures me that we, we can get around that. It doesn't have to be directional, so, so we'll see. And really, it's, it's power supply and the, the onboard data handling and things like that can, can all just be part of the, the general power supply and OBDH and so on for the satellite itself. Um, so we're in the early stages of requirements analysis and having to talk to them a lot, and that's a, that's the thing that the team are looking at now in terms of the meeting the requirements of both of these things. Uh, the key thing is this Space Park Leicester, because I, I'm part of the Midlands Innovation Space Group, which you'll see a bit of later on, and uh, of course Space Park Leicester hasn't been opened all that long. It's a fabulous facility. If the little video works, I'll, I'll try and show you a bit. But it's, it's Space Park Leicester who are, who are building this thing for them. So most of our liaison will be with them rather than the guy at Exeter who doesn't know much about the engineering involved with his experiment. Um, so that's just a kind of a breakdown of what I told you. Space debris mitigation and collision avoidance maneuvering for UKLSL. And this is the guy who's doing this, and, and this is John Holt from Space Park Leicester. So for me, it's great because, um, you know, although I'm within this Midlands Innovation Group, I'm keen to be able to get in, you know, cause, because there's, there's fantastic concurrent engineering facilities and test facilities and clean room stuff and all that. So this is going to give me a, a big foot in the door <laughs> with Space Park without paying, hopefully. So, and it'll help to enhance my kind of credentials, hopefully, with them. But it's interesting to have those two sorts of payload. Nice to see faces. I'm going to just flash through a few teams here because it's people who really matter with this. This is what we're doing it for, not for anything else. And uh, this is one of the very early teams. Claire is now a systems engineer with ESA. She's at Aztec. Uh, I don't know whether they all are. Ben, ben did work for Surrey Satellite Technology. I think he's moved on somewhere else. Ken is fairly high up in, uh, in Finian, uh, based in Austria. So they all end up in very good jobs, and it, they're all the same kind of mix. I'll just pick a few out just as we flick through here. You'll see the, we, we, we have to, of course, show all our logos, you know, quite a lot. Um, so quite a few faces here. 
of people who've moved on, you know, they're now all around the world, and you know, it's, the, the, we have our own alumni, I'm still in touch with all of them, and some of them are nearly in their 40s now, so they, um, you know, they all get the newsletters and things like that, that's the picture you just saw earlier on, um, yeah, let's just pick one or two out, uh, yeah, she, she works for Rolls Royce now, she's got a very good job there, I think she's doing, she's doing a PhD with the Open University in space related things, um, yeah, I Isabella here, she was holding offers from Boeing and from Airbus well before she qualified. She went to Boeing in the end, but she was very good. Um, Will is now also working for Surrey Satellite Technology. So we're in touch with all of them, and it's just great to see what they go into. And their CVs when they do this, as I say, are very impressive. <clears throat> and that was last year's team. Um, that we're working mainly on WUSAT 3. But we always try and do things. You know, we, we went to Barcelona with them in April to the SSEA conference, the ESA um, Space Educational Activities Conference. So, you know, it, obviously everybody can't be at a launch, but, you know, we, we try and do things. We have very close contacts with, with Airbus and people like that, um, which I'll tell you about later. So the key thing that this is kind of leading to is that WUSAT is now sort of punching well above its weight. As I say, there's big players in Warwick, people who, are, who hold massive research funds, way more than anything I do. But somehow, when everybody looks at space at Warwick, this is what they see. Probably you can see why. So I've ended up being on the board of SPAN, the Space Academic Network, which is the UK's you know, uh, organisation for all universities that, uh, that do space work. Uh, which is quite an important sort of role. They're like an important lobbying organisation for the government. And as part of that, I'm on, also on the UK Space Engineering Technology Working Group. Um, I'm also, as I said, on, on this Midlands Innovation Space Group. And the funny thing is, I spend more time with these guys than anybody I do at Warwick. I mean, the, the, the people at Leicester and Nottingham and Cranfield and so on are, are more like my work colleagues than because <laughs> people at Warwick, particularly in engineering, are not, not really space people. So it's been very good for me. Um, and of course, you know, because WUSAT is this kind of dedicated spacecraft engineering setup, which is quite unique within universities because they can't put that multidisciplinary thing together very well. Um, it's, it's become sort of quite important. Let me just remind myself what my next, yeah. And also part of that is that you may know that within recent times, as part of the UK space strategy, uh, the UK set up space clusters. And I'm not really happy with how this is being done. They, it, it, effectively, they split us originally and made an East and a West Midlands space cluster. So, of course, Warwick was in the West Midlands one, and there isn't a lot in the West Midlands. You know, we've already got a Midlands Innovation Space Group. So, through a lot of pressure, with, with me banging the table a bit as well, the Midlands Aerospace Alliance, who are running this, were very good, to be fair to them. And we've now got this... this collation of east and west and we have a midland space cluster so of course these will these will bring in all the companies as well and they'll, they'll, they'll mirror the other space clusters around um, so again you know that has been very important in that you know it's always me it's not anybody else at Warwick it's always me that goes to these things it's always me with the big mouth you know sort of shouting but it, you know it's, it's getting things done and it means the kind of importance of WUSAT outside of Warwick funnily enough is it, quite important um, I'll, I'll just try this. I had a little bit of trouble with it. I thought I'd just show you a little bit of Space Park Leicester because it's now obviously a very important central facility within this space cluster and within the Midlands Innovation Space Group. Let's just see. I think last time this worked, it um, stopped my slides moving. It's only a promo thing, but it's interesting to see. It's a fabulous facility. this bit. <laughs> a guy walking backwards with a sack truck. <laughs> Pallet truck. Uh, you see, it's a promo thing, but it, it, it is good. It, you know, that they've got the Centre for Earth Observation based there, and I think Rolls-Royce have got facilities and so on based there. And I think it's going to build quite a lot, and it'll be very important to this, this Midlands cluster and the Midlands space group. And if I can get my slides moving forwards again, we might be a bit lucky. I had a bit of trouble last time. Ah, right. 
And uh, I'm very pleased today, just quite recently, um, I was quite flattered that, that Le Leicester were asked if they could appoint me as external advisor for their MSc in spacecraft engineering, which is, you know, would we'll, we'll use these really excellent facilities in there. So I was pleased to, to do that, again, because it, it, it enhances my contacts with Leicester and with this facility. And so there'll be an approval panel taking place sometime in the next month or two, you know, to get this MSc up and running. So that's the kind of thing we want to see, really, I think, to, to see students, you know, coming into STEM subjects anyway, but also particularly seeing you know the, the this drive towards space and so on right so there's a UK size that's proposal the bit that's in my um, in my title um, what happened here was that on the board of span the space academic network some time ago um, uh, we, we got involved, mainly myself and a guy from the Open University, um, to put together this, this proposal that there should be something like this, you know, where we have a SISATS program where exactly that kind of thing, companies have got things they want to develop uh, um, or researchers have got things they want to develop, um, you know, have somewhere to go, you know, somebody can develop something like we're doing. Uh, and of course, Woos, that was an ideal model for that. Um, and so a proposal was put in uh, through the UK Space Agency. It went into the, what they call the CSR, the Comprehensive Spending Review. And in somewhere in the mix, it's sort of part of the UK <laughs> National Space Strategy. And of course, they use WUSAT and a budget for WUSAT for WUSAT 3 as a kind of a model of how all this could work. Which again is quite a thing for us to be involved with, considering where we started from, you know. Um, and that, that's the idea to provide this national route for rapid access to space. And of course, you know, the, the idea of these is it seven space ports that they, they, they identified? Nuki really is the main one. I don't think a lot of them are going to do much more than sounding rockets between me and you. That, that's what I've heard. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, it, it, it's there and we're hoping to, 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 to use it. And of course, the idea of, of this training the next generation. And I could personally see a model where, although it isn't easy for all universities, what I try and do now is extend the WUSAT team to these other universities universities within the Midland Space Group. So if we don't have any expertise in attitude determination control, and a guy at Loughborough does, why can't one or two of his students work on WUSAT with us? Or if there's somebody good on comms at Leicester or something, you know, and, and let's have a virtual bigger team. Well, of course, universities in other space clusters could do that. So that, that's kind of what I'm sort of driving at. Um, to, to, to try and implement this UK SISATS proposal, you know, uh, along with everything else that's, that, that's going on. And as I say, WUSAT 4 particularly is an ideal demonstration of, of, of you know, how, how this could work and help lead to commercialisation. Now, the thing is, and this is, for me, is a very British thing. This, this, this goes right back to, you know, the, the blacksmith doing the dirty work, you know, so we, we don't rate engineering, somehow it just sort of happens. <laughs> so what they've done in these space clusters, and it's nobody's fault of the people who are trying to do it, they're doing their best, Midlands Aerospace Alliance and so on. They concentrate heavily on what's the upstream, who wants to put things in space, what researchers have we got in this area who are doing either research to go into space, or maybe materials that you know, work in extreme environments, advanced manufacturing, whatever. You know, let's identify all the people who can put things in the, into space. And then let's look at how we can make money out of it. Let's identify all the people who want data from satellites and things like that. Who, who are all the users, all the researchers and so on. And that's what they focus on, and that's the cluster. And hardly anybody looks at this. <laughs> you know, how are we going to actually do it? Because... You know, we follow, as I said to you early on, a very strict systems engineering approach driven by Julia. <laughs> this is how you do it. You know, you don't just, you know, sort of work on an ad hoc basis and cobble it together. There's a proper process by which you do this. The only people I know who follow those sort of routes are people like ESA and NASA and within this country, you know, Airbus, Telesalenia Space, Surrey Satellite Technology, that they follow those sort of routes because they have to get their stuff through ESA or whoever they're launching with. Um, but of course, they're not interested in CubeSats. <laughs> they're not going to do stuff like this. It's, it's, it's way out of their league. They only want to do big space stuff. So who's going to do it? And it, it's, it's, it's like a mindset that they, they haven't thought about this at all. So again, that's something else I try and introduce. And I think the message is getting across. And I think personally that this model of WUSAT 
um, you know, could be something that they could take up in, as I say, in other, uh, other areas and adopt it in some ways because it ticks both boxes. It gets the job done and at the same time it's training students who, who understand this principle of what's required to walk a satellite through until it's flight ready with ESA or wherever else. And I, I know I'm going to do some boasting now because I can tell you that um, with the European Space Agency, I've been over to STEC and I've given talks at their request to other European universities because they like the model of WUSAP that much and the, and the companies we bring in and everything else that they would like other universities to follow this. And I know from students who've been there on training courses that they've come back and said, well, there was somebody from a, you know, another European university who asked the ESA staff, you know, we think we'd like to do CubeSats. And they've actually said, well, you should talk to WUSAP, which is quite... <laughs> Again, from where we started, it's quite a thing, isn't it, for, for Easter staff to be telling somebody else, which is, but, you know, it's good. It, it just means it's something that, that seems to have caught on, and um, we just need it recognised here, and, you know, can we adapt? I mean, I haven't got much longer to go. I'm getting near the, I'm getting near the door at the end, so they better hurry up, because cause otherwise I, shall, uh, I shan't be here much longer. But I can see another two or three years might be about it. So, but that's the position that I see, you know, that, 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 that usual weakness in who's going to do the engineering properly and how are we going to do it. So uh, anyway, it's interesting that, that, that that's, uh, you know, that's something I think we could lean to. So here you are, look, see, important partner that, that we need. So th these do change a bit depending what, you know, what we're working on and things like that. But mostly they love being involved with this. Barry knows that you know, before COVID we used to have an end of year uh, team day where we had a meal and, and the students presented what they were doing. I would present you know, the broader picture of where we were with other stuff and uh, it was a nice day, wasn't it, Barry? And then we'd have a meal in one of the Warwick um, uh, restaurants or something. You know, the, uh, so that, that was good. And, and I think the, the companies and all the people like meeting the students, like talking to them, and they also like meeting each other as well, surprisingly. And what was good for me was it would get quite competitive you'd hear that some company was doing something or giving us something and you'd think, well, yeah, we, can, we can do that, yeah, we can, we can. And, and, and you get a bit of that kind of competitive thing. People actually go out to the car and bring a box of goodies or something in. N notice even my bag lock is provided by Harwin because <laughs> they were being outdone by somebody else, so we all had a bag full of goodies, which I still use now. Um, but, yeah, it's a, it's a nice setup, and, uh, you know, we, we, we get a lot out of it. Obviously, as I say, most of our student engineers, you know, I had, I think, nearly half the team last year were holding contracts from Airbus before Christmas. <laughs> That's what the companies want, because they're seeing these guys working in a, a very proactive way, showing all the things they're looking for, high-level documentation, good at presenting their work, managing a multidisciplinary team, managing knowledge, because you have to hand over from one team to another, all the things they're looking for really so that, that that's why they're quite keen and uh, it's, it's very good i have monthly meetings with there but i'm actually sitting on our progress meetings once a fortnight now so it's great to have those you know those kind of connections and uh, look at that that's about it <laughs> Yeah, I'll just finish that picture so uh, it entertains others. So any, anybody want to? Oh, thank you, Bill. Um, as he says, any questions? Oh, there, I come from Peterborough. Oh, and right. obviously we've got the new university started there. Yeah. Have you reached out in that direction yet? Um, I didn't have anything to do with the, the, uh, the, the teams that are in the Midland universities. Are Warwick, uh, Leicester, Nottingham, Aston, Keel... Birmingham, Cranfield, and Loughborough. So I think they've gone for, it depends on the, 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 most of them have got quite big research kind of profiles and they've also got space heritage. So I think that's what they made the decision on. But if people are, they're keen to bring anybody in, companies yeah, or it, universities. It's, it's very so, new, I'll make them aware of uh, Yeah, what's yeah, they, they, they should be aware of it because I, I don't see any reason why people can't start to have some involvement and some link to things and if they want to build up what they do. 
later on. I mean, as you see with Warwick, I mean, we don't, have a, we don't have an aerospace degree. They're all just doing classic engineering. But if you're doing classic engineering, you know, just like when you go to a company, if a client wants a job doing, you've got, you've got to be able to apply your skills to whatever's needed, haven't you? And they can apply themselves to doing a satellite project when they get to that level. They just need the, the requirements and all the stuff they need for that environment that they're applying it to. And no reason why another university coming into it, you know, can't do something similar as well. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Anything from the stream, Phil? Uh, yes. Does WooSat have an amateur radio payload? So, does WooSat have an amateur radio payload? No, no, we don't. No, no. Uh, um, I don't know how we end up getting our payload sometimes. It's, it, it just seems to sort of happen. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, if anybody kind of get in touch with us, depending where we are and, you know, if, what teams we've got coming in and if, if we're almost finishing something and starting to look at something else and things like that, we'd, we'd always be interested in anybody. And particularly with that, of course, we'd have the advantage of guys like you who would be, be inherently involved with it who, who could help us a lot, you know, with, with all the aspects of it. So, uh, yeah. But not at the moment, no. Okay. Any more questions at all? Okay. And I guess. Thank you again. All right. Bill. Nice, to, nice to be here. <laughs> and if memory serves, we're back here at uh, one thirty, so we've finished on time, and we've got an hour for lunch. Yeah.